All right, we've got the lessons for this week uh, on bird molt. I've got some slides up on the on the uh, board with uh, slides from this show, so you can follow along there and make notes as you need. Need um, it's. Uh, I'm going to break it up into a couple sections because uh, it's long and complicated. That's what everyone thinks about what they study. So let's see. Share screen. Let me do this and then I can start the slideshow. All right, so I'm hoping you can see the slide well. So understanding avian molt, this is our effort to get a closer sense of how birds go through their plumage, uh, plumages from an egg all the way to being adult bird. So right here I wanna um, show on this slide uh, what it is we're dealing with. Right here we've got pictures of our special Olympic Peninsula gull. This is the hybrid between Glaucus wing gulls that breed to the north and western gulls that breed along the coast to the south. The western gulls are characterized by darker backs, darker gray backs in the adults with very black wingtips. The Glaucus wings um, lack that black feature. They're quite pale. So the hybrids are somewhere in between, like this adult right here, doing a nice job showing his old wing. Now, when they're born and fledge out of the nest, the young gulls uh, emerge with this very brown plumage, really quite different than the adults. So somewhere along the way, the young birds go from this to this. And it might uh, seem like, a, well, all you have to do is replace your feathers. Uh, and that's what this whole subject is about. How does that, how does a bird go about that? Turns out in gulls, it's a longer process where they go through several years and stages of replacing these brown juvenile feathers into the adult version of their plumage. What's interesting is that we're dealing not just with replacement, but there's a whole process that occurs just while the feathers are on the body. So. The surprising thing here is that this is a picture also of an Olympic gull, maybe a little bit on the paler side, more like a glaucous wing gull, but it is emerging out of the same plumage that this bird is in. Notice how these feathers are nice and entire. They're quite fresh. This bird is a fresh hatchling probably in August of the year when they emerge out of the nest and they're following their adults around begging for food. So they're easy to distinguish at that point. These feathers wear down over the course of the year. And what this picture shows is a bird with extreme feather wear. Notice that, for example, on these long flight feathers, they should be barbed all the way to the tip, but this is how much of that feather has worn off. Um, look at the tail. You can see the same thing on the tail. It's really quite worn down, kind of to, to maybe three quarters or four fifths of the length of the feather is just missing. And that's from um, sun UV irradiation, making feathers brittle and then wearing down. It's really got to replace its feathers. Well, and it started that here, you see some of the gray feathers coming in. It's already replaced the greater coverts and parts of the mantle. But here's a lot of that juvenile plumage still, still present here in the wing. This dark, the dark parts, are completely worn off. Here, these feathers are growing in. So they're already being replaced closer to the kind of uh, adult uh, gray feathers, although they don't have the white edging yet. So you can see that it can be complicated to figure out what stage of life a bird is in, um, but you can by looking at the feathers closely, looking at their patterns and their colors to dif differentiate the different age groups but also to look at the wear on the feathers and the bleaching to see how far along they are in their process. So to get a handle on this, I'll introduce you to this world of avian molt. Uh, so I was at a conference where uh, one of the where we had a breakout session at the end with some discussion. Another ornithologist opened up the discussion and said, uh, the quote you see above, I've always thought of molt about as interesting as watching paint dry. 
but her point was that the paper we were presenting was um, made it more interesting because what we were doing is we weren't just describing the pattern of molt like you see here in this baby um, swallow and just growing its flight feathers for the first time. This is what it looks like in the nest. But we were uh, relating how birds replace their feathers to the ecology of the birds, to particular features of their life cycle, life history cycle, cycles. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot more to it than just watching these feathers grow over about two weeks onto a bird. Let's see, I have to move this thing here. Yeah, molt is kind of a stepchild of ornithology. It hasn't re really received that much attention. Um, and in fact, in some of the, in some ways, we're still in the descriptive phase of study. That is, we're still describing how birds replace their feathers rather than thinking about what it means in the uh, life cycle of the bird, what the ecology of it is. Um, and yet, it's one of the three major life history stages. If you think about what birds do in the course of the year, they breed, um, they go through a non-breeding phase that might include migration. So that's another big step. And then the third really big thing they do is um, molt, replace their feathers. And yet, for a bird as common as song sparrow, the common reference, for example, says that song sparrows don't replace any feathers in spring. Yet here I am holding a song sparrow I caught, showing quite a bit of feather replacement on the back in spring, it, right here in Skagit County in Washington. Song sparrows occur all over the country and I've caught them all over and few places show as much feather replacement in the spring as I've seen on these Washington birds. So something interesting is going on there, but we're still just describing what it is. And so it's just a, a long, long process of figuring out what the details are so that we can start thinking about what the details mean. The descriptive part has so far uh, focused on understanding differences between uh, different sexes here in Baltimore Oriole, but Oriole between males and females and age differences because understanding sex and age differences allows us under to understand a lot more about well other life history stages like breeding males and females or like population structure um, age uh, age um, age tables of of populations how how age pyramids are structured and so a lot of the work that describes molt hasn't been to think about molt as a life history stage, but in order to make more sense of the stages of life history that get more attention. Frankly, molting birds can be pretty ugly. They often look like that worn out um, gull with just some feathers coming in. They can be hard to identify as a result and they can just seem confusing. Why are some birds that worn, others not? And so I think that confounding aspect has made it difficult to make a lot of progress. Okay, let's see. Oh, there we go. So what is molt really? Well, if you think about a um, medium-sized passerine, um, I've actually counted all the feathers on the body just to get some numbers there. There's about 3,600 feathers on a mid-sized passerine like a black-headed grosbeak. Those feathers, when you pluck them, they weigh about, there's probably a little moisture in there, um, but I left them for a couple days overnight to dry. 3.6 grams, which is about uh, less than 10% of the body mass is just in, the, in, the, in all these feathers. But it's just 56 flight feathers of this 3,600, so a tiny fraction that make up the flight feathers that make up 30% of the feather mass. So most of the a lot of the feather mass is um, when you grow feathers, it, each individual flight feather makes up a significant portion of what you're doing as a bird when you're replacing those feathers. So one of the features about uh, bird molt is um, thinking about its cost. Here I just say flat out, complete replacement is costly because it requires about four to six weeks at a metabolic rate of 15% above basal metabolic rate. Well, 
this is a conclusion. This complete replacement is costly. Turns out that the initial paper published by an ornithologist uh, thinking about molt, who put molting birds in uh, metabolic chambers, oxygen chambers, to measure their metabolic rate, he found these results 15% above basal. And he said, ooh, that's not very much. It's not that costly to molt. So the initial paper that everyone cites about molt costs actually says that molt isn't very costly. Um, and I think that's affected how people think about molt. It's, they feel like it must be like, for mammals, growing hair. We just do it and it doesn't seem to, to um, take anything away from our other activities. And so if it's just 15% in birds, it can't be very costly. But I think that's, that misinterprets what it is to be a bird. The costs include not just the energy to grow the feathers, but the cost of having crappy old feathers if you weren't to molt. And so your flight capacity, as you can imagine for that gull, starts going down once the feathers wear down to that extent. We also see evidence for costliness in that there's a precise sequence of replacement that is highly variable among species. So lots of birds, um, all the birds uh, replace their feathers, but lots of birds do it in very particular ways. And uh, understanding this variation is part of the challenge of this descriptive phase of molt, understanding molt. Here I've got a picture of a yellow-breasted chat. You can see again, the costliness of that uh, molt is also in failing to molt. You see these feathers are, are pretty worn down. And that's even though, look, these feathers right here, one, two, three, <clears throat> these innermost tertials, and these outermost feathers, outer three, have been specially replaced to be fresher than these middle ones. You can see that at the, on the brown basal color of these feathers because they're bleached out and the greenish fresher color of these more recently replaced feathers. You can also see it along the main shaft here. See this brown shaft and the dark brown almost blackish shaft here. So these were replaced and yet wear has worn out even these replaced ones. You also see that there's variation in which feathers wear out. So you can see how specific this is to replace the feathers at the outer edge of the wing that experience apparently the most wear. So characterizing all that has, has been challenging. I'm kind of one of the first people to look at feather wear patterns among different species and among different feathers. Believe it or not, here we are in the 21st century and uh, we're still just looking at feather wear patterns. Here you can see what that looks like in uh, this particular kind of sequencing in a yellow rumped warbler, an Audubon's warbler with the yellow on the throat and a little yellow crown. Here are the old brown feathers, see that? And this adult is now starting to replace these inner primaries. This one and this one is fresh and clean. And this one is just growing. You can see it's not quite, quite as long as the other ones. It's gonna fill in, oops, it's gonna fill in a space here in length between this one and this one. And you can see that these older feathers are quite worn out. You can imagine a bird like this trying to chase down insects in the canopy of trees, has only these crappy feathers to work with. Growing this new set, set of feathers can make all that work seem so much easier, I imagine, like getting a new set of muscles or something, um, if we were able to do that for a bird that's growing in those feathers. So you can see that the cost is um, actually, we can uh, investigate that uh, kind of cost by looking at the specificity of these patterns in different bird species under different conditions. So what I'm getting at is that I think one reason we've misunderstood it is because it, avian molt really is uniquely avian. It, bird feathers don't replace like reptile molt. Reptile molt is very different or insect molt or uh, crustacean molt is a very different process. Um, uh, and that probably has to do with the fact that the feathers are uh, uniquely avian that kind of defines them as a group. <clears throat> so the molt patterns affect the age and sex plumages. Um, so molt is important for the signaling functions of plumage, 
and for camouflage. Uh, and I would say that the ecology of molt has been underappreciated, but bears as much scrutiny and variability and trade-off study as uh, breeding bird ecology or migration ecology. We've come to understand that there's different strategies to be a successful breeder, different strategies for migration, and why not? Why shouldn't we see molt in the same way? And those variations in strategy yield uh, something I like to call molt ecology um, as a kind of a new subject. You won't see that in most uh, in the older um, ornithology texts. Just doesn't include molt in in an older text. There's a um, uh, the text we're using, an older version, it only includes molt as a sidebar in, in two chapters. It doesn't even have a chapter about molt. Molt timing can be so specific that it even distinguishes some similar species from one another. Um, uh, that's one of the things that Allison and I are studying in Borneo. Uh, we're traveling to Borneo, catching birds and looking at these molt strategies to determine whether these life history patterns that we see in the Bornean birds can help reveal something about um, their, their species differentiation within the island. So we're gonna talk about um, a number of different features of this to give you kind of a broad sense of what uh, we're, one could be looking at in this multi-ecology. We'll look briefly at feather growth just to give you a basis for understanding what molt uh, is doing and how it works. Then we'll look at the difference at the variation in molt strategies that I alluded to. We'll look at um, the specifics of typical molt sequences and we'll look at a little bit of uh, um, life history scheduling, how molt fits into the annual cycle and how we can use that to understand um, the characteristics of avian cycles. And then we'll do a little bit of age and sex in the field because that's what you'll be doing in, uh, in your field work in, in the next week. So I've got a slide here on, um, on the basics of feather structure. And that's because I want you to have a basic understanding of what's going on there. Um, what I found confusing when I first learned about feathers was there's that the rachis, the main shaft of the feather, is considered distinct from the calamus, the base of the feather. And that, that's confusing because what we're doing is we're looking at these highly derived feathers. Apparently the basal feathers, the first feathers to evolve, had a um, slightly different feature that's still retained on some birds. And I wanna point that out just because it makes it so much more fascinating. Now I'm gonna start with this. Uh, yeah, let me just not share for us, end sharing for a moment. So you can see this more clearly. So this is a quill of a, um, oops. These are quills of porcupine. And I just show this to illustrate that feathers are simply a structure evolved for a specific purpose. And some reptilian, well, we know now theropod, uh, dinosaurian ancestor um, had some kind of uh, extensions off the body, kind of like this porcupine had that did something. These quills are actually from a porcupine that fell out of a tree in the middle of the night, missing my head in the Belize rainforest by about two feet. And when I opened my tent after the thud, right by my head, um, there on the tarp was this imprint of a, of a porcupine of the quills it had left behind. So these are hollow, and um, one could imagine that this might be some kind of um, variation of the initial, uh, not appendages, but uh, projections from the dermis of the, those uh, precursors to the birds. It turns out that the uh, feature that's basal to birds is this kind, something like this. 
And what's special about this as opposed to the quill is that it has two extensions and that's where the calamus comes in. So the calamus is the base of the feather here um, that holds the attachment for what turns out to be a double shaft. So this double shaft is the feature characteristic of, of birds. This is an emu feather, one of our basal ratites among all the birds. Um, and uh, a lot of emu feathers are characterized by this uh, double shaftedness. So two rachides and one calamus holding them both in place, um, coming off from a single follicle. Um, the special feature of this double shaft is that through evolution, that double shaft could be modified. And so here you see a feather, a single feather of a, um, I don't even know, but some kind, well, I think it's a pheasant, some kind of, um, some kind of uh, a gal gal gallinaceous bird. And you'll notice that it also has two basic shafts, but they're asymmetrical. So see, this one is, a, is called an aftershaft. And it's characteristic of the gallinaceous birds. A lot of the body feathers have that aftershaft, that second feather, but it's smaller. And you can see how it, how, um, by evolving, to have more fluffy fluffiness uh, in the barbs, it serves better as a heat uh, retainer. Whereas the other feather can, the other part of the feather, I should say, can serve as the contour feather that makes it aerodynamic. So it can highlight both features that are important to feathers, keeping warm and providing aerodynamics. And then of course, um, the feathers we think of as feathers, well, they're like this. Here's an, I think this is an Argus feather. Um, and we think of them as just single shafted. Um, but in fact, if you look closely at large feathers, you'll see at the base of the feather down here, there's a little bit of a mark. That mark is the evolutionary uh, remnant, the residual aftershaft, the residual second shaft. Losing that second shaft and um, the parts of the follicle that made that second shaft allowed um, that area of the follicle to produce a larger, a wider feather in the first place, and eventually to create the uh, asymmetry in feathers that we see today that allow birds to fly because they've got a nice wide um, kind of firm outer margin on the flight feathers and a wider inner margin that creates the foil that allows lift to take place. So it's the, it's the double width of the double shaft that allowed the length needed to create effective flying feathers, I think, that um, uh, distinguished birds as an evolutionary feature. Now let's go back to sharing. Okay, there we go. And so that's what I wanted to illustrate here. Here's a, oh, well, here if you can see is a peacock feather. Here's the nice tip. And here I just wanted you to see here you can see the individual barbs that make up a feather in peacocks, the tail feathers. The barbs are separated out so that they, you can see them individually. And so you can see how that creates a lot of variability for producing a feather with different functions. Oops. Just to illustrate schematically this uh, feature of, of feathers, uh, when a feather grows, it grows out of a collar, a ring in the follicle, a ring of dividing cells, as illustrated where right down here. This collar um, has two central points, two central focus, foci for growth. And those become the rachis on one side and the rachis on the other. So this is kind of like the asymmetrical um, a gallinaceous feather we were looking at before. And so you can see how these cells here along the collar halfway through are creating these waves of division that 
uh, eventually connect to the shaft and produce um, the, the feather structure we see. And then in this quarter, they, the wave propagates this way and attaches to this feather. And you can see how the, ace, uh, the, the symmet symmetry <clears throat> that we saw in the emu feather means that the division would be here halfway between the two rachis points. Um, and then over evolution to create an, a single a f a calamus with a single rachis, um, all these dividing waves would be co-opted by the growth focusing onto th this rachis eventually yielding, you know, waves of, uh, re of uh, replication that propagate all the way around to attach to this rickets rather than to this one. And then at the very end, um, the when the feather is full grown, this collar, you can imagine, kind of lumps together and creates a single calamus to tie it all together. That's a particular feature of um, this kind of branching growth that I think is unique to birds in that the branches grow first through this propagating cell division here and only after further growth do they attach to the structure holding the, holding the um, branches. That's remarkable. Every other branching structure I think basically grows from the main trunk out and then creates the smaller branches off. So this is a, a pretty remarkable structure. How does it create? How does this cell division create these, um, these individual barbs? That's a, a cool process that we can see here in this whoa image, three-dimensional image, maybe a little hard to see, um, but it's a three-dimensional representation of a cutout of a follicle. Um, I've never done this, um, but it's, it would be a cool study. And here the feature that I'm trying to show is apoptosis. I know there's a lot to see here, so um, just bear with me. So here's that collar of, of dividing cells, and they produce um, a structure uh, that is variable in density as it, as it um, moves along here, as the cell reproduction moves along here. Where it's dense, it produces a, um, a barb that eventually will attach to the shaft. And where it's not dense, where the, uh, where the cell reproduction falls off briefly, um, you create a, kind of a thin web of material that intentionally falls apart. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death. And so um, while all these cells are dying, the cells that are dying that are these weak areas will end up separating out. Here it looks like it's separate from the, from the start, but probably inside um, what's going on is it's at first it's a little bit connected and then that connection breaks apart to leave these separate strands um, independent, independent as you can see in this cutout here that eventually as this cell production propagates along here in a wave for each barb, eventually attaches to the um, shaft. And so you can see, think of all these, these kind of specialized waves of cell reproduction moving along this collar toward the shaft where that barb will attach. Really quite a remarkable process. And so it's important that it started out with the double-sided collar that then could um, produce both heat warming um, after shaft feathers and largely asymmetrical feathers co-opting all the, um, the uh, cell reproduction around this whole collar to make very large flight feathers. So when you're replacing all your feathers, um, how do you go about it? Uh, just randomly, we often think that um, like the birds we have in captivity, if you've had a, had a, a cockatiel or a budgie, it seems like they just kind of start dropping feathers and it all seems kind of random. Maybe it's, it's just random. If it's not random, what are the other options? And I'm gonna pause this, close this video down. We'll start the next one about the strategies. And before you do that, you can think about, well, if I've got 3,600 feathers, what are the strategies I can use to replace those feathers? And uh, how 
keep in mind that if it's costly, how can I space out that cost so that it doesn't all happen at once? In a lot of what we'll do, we'll talk about the flight feathers as a stand-in for the whole plumage, just because as I pointed out, they are so large, each individual feather makes a, a, a measurable proportion of the whole um, feather material on the body. And it's much easier to keep track of 50 feathers, 50 some feathers for the flight feathers than it is to keep track of 3,600. All right.